This live stream series is sponsored by Slice Engineering and the Mosquito Magnum Plus Hardened. Push absurd amounts of filament while maintaining the structural integrity of the Mosquito design. The Mosquito Magnum Plus can be configured with up to 100 watts of heating power, redundant 500 degrees Celsius rated thermistors, and air or water cooling. I'll be using the Magnum Plus for this build, and you can find the links in the description below. Also, Do It 3D, the Vorum Printed Forward team, and Lineo were kind enough to provide some of their high quality parts for this build free of charge. I've purchased the rest of the parts on the regular, like the Formbot kit, upgrades from Fermier Labs, and little bits here and there. You can find links for everything in the description below. Now, let's get started with the build. All right, let's keep going with the build. Are you guys appreciating how I'm, how I'm managing to recite that intro segment perfectly every single time? Uh, well, well, well. So, let's see. Let's see if uh, this stream goes better than the one yesterday. Um, I think it was actually uh, a router that I had set up that day that it was wrecking havoc or wreaking havoc on the network that was... I don't know. Um, whenever I had that, so I, I got a new mesh access point set up, and whenever that single, that that one down there, uh, was connected to the wired network to to Ethernet here, OBS would have uh, CPU uh, load issues. It was at like fifty percent CPU, and I was getting package loss and all sorts of stuff. Even though that's just a Wi-Fi access point, and no data is going through it, so I have no idea. What was going on there so yeah it's disconnected now it should be fine uh let me know if we are seeing stutters today or other technical issues but uh while you guys were gone while i was uh well, well during during that one day 
day before yesterday where I had a bit of time where I wasn't streaming, I did a bunch of things to this printer and to the setup that I would like to share with you. So I did a, a bit of uh, crimping, a bit of wiring because like wiring and stuff is not fun to watch because well I, I'm gonna have you guys in my in my neck. Is that at is that running at 30 frames? That's looking weird. Um, anyways, I did some wiring, uh, some crimping. I crimped connectors to all the stepper motor leads. So these are the Z motors that are directly in the bottom compartment going all the way down there. So these are the JST uh, VH connectors, I believe. Uh, why are you so... Okay, I might need to, to restart that camera. Um, just the VH connectors, which go directly into the Duets motor connectors. Some more connectors back here that are gonna get, where are you? There you are, um, that are gonna get connected there. These are a pain to crimp and, oops, these are a pain to crimp. And I realized I did not have the correct tools because these connectors are really huge. <laughs> they don't fit my, um, they don't fit my engineer pliers. So I got the, which ones are these? Uh, the PA09, I believe there are different ones that are a bit larger, but uh, VH connectors are way too large for these. Uh, they also do not fit like this generic crimpy tool uh, that supposedly works for DuPont, but just does not work for DuPont because this just smashes them. Absolutely. Um, yeah, that, so so that was a bit of a a bit of a, a hassle to figure out. The other connectors that I did were these. So these are Molex Microfit. Um, on the A and B motor, B motor is over here, and these are just crimped onto the motors themselves, and then that's going to hook up to the wiring loom. Now the um, I see a super chat in my brain goes like, okay, too many things to concentrate on. Um, these were a bit of a tricky one to crimp as well because, oh god, where did I put these? Um, the foam art kit included a bunch of crimps for those connectors for the microfits, but for these dreams. Nice sequence, Tom. But the ones that were included in the kit were garbage. For some reason I could not get a good I could not get a good crimp with those. Um, instead I used the ones that uh, Linio included with the wiring loom, which are flash gold uh, at least, and the ones that are included with the foam bot kit are just uh, nickel plated, I believe they are. Definitely better quality um, crimp crimps there, so I used those and those worked uh, well enough. Um, the PA09 were fine for crimping those, but uh, I I I I would rather not have you guys watch that, which is why I did it off camera. Uh, thank you for the five, Derek Zero. Nice sequence. All right. Um. So, what am I missing? Not much. Okay. Microfit 3.0 D pinning tool. Yeah, so what the, the thing with these Microfit connectors is they don't have like that opening that you have on DuPont connectors um, where you have that, that locking latch sticking out on one side. Instead, these are completely enclosed. So what you're going to need to unlock these is kind of a sleeve tool that you slide in from the from the contact from the pin side between your crimp and the housing you slide it in and then you can pull it out so that's keep it up man you that's a tricky one these machines go together <laughs> thanks for the five plate scraper yeah so that's like i said i'm i'm not i'm not showing you everything because some parts of the build are not fun to watch some parts are just hey you do the same thing over and over 50 times you crimp 50 individual pins uh, and that just does not tend to be something that I enjoy. I enjoy being watched when, when when it's happening, and it's typically also not something that you know I can make enjoyable for you guys to watch. So can we decide what is fun? Well, I I mean I can show you like one crimp going on, and then you can put that video that that segment on loop for two hours, and yeah. So what I did since the last stream took me like four or five hours. Uh, working on it to get everything sorted out. Uh, because the other thing that I also did is I mounted the Mosquito Magnum Plus and you can see it in there. It is quite uh, it's quite the chonker. Actually, let me take this out and 
should I take this out? Yeah, let me let me take this out and kind of show you what's going on here. What's up with Motorola? Yeah, Molex connectors. <laughs> so, okay. Where else are you locked in? Uh, that should be it, right? And get those screws out. Come on. Come on. So, yeah, the Mosquito Magnum Plug. Ah, why are you stuck in there? The Mosquito Magnum Plus was a bit of a challenge to mount because it is, it's rather large. Um, the mounting parts for these, for, for this one, did work out perfectly. Maybe if I slightly tilt this? Oh yeah, that works. Come on. There we go. Um, so yeah, the Mosquito Magnum Plus was a bit of a tricky one to mount. Um, the top set is identical to the Mosquito. But the bottom part obviously is a lot longer than a stock um, slice engineering mosquito that you'd use. So the I think the, the direction this is intended to go is the other way around with the labeling kind of sticking out towards the front because that's the that's the front of the machine. However, because this has such a large whoops, this has such a large bulge right there it was budding it was literally touching the sensor and i know these like to melt so i decided to flip this around how do you like your bosch go so far i'll get to that in a second um so i did flip this around and now there is some space between maybe i can i can rotate this and kind of show you yeah back here maybe maybe nah that's gonna be that's gonna be tricky to, to look into, but yeah, there, there, maybe you can see... Basically, in front of this sensor, now there is the tiniest amount of space. So, back there. So it's it's not touching the sensor. Uh, the other thing that I did was, yes, uh, the Viper Man, I did add aluminum tape to the sensor itself. I also added aluminum tape to the mounting hardware. Um, that's... I don't know where, where I got this from. I think it was including in, in some AC or cooling unit or something. Uh, aluminized tape, I believe this is. This isn't like actually aluminum, but it's, um, yeah, it's, it's aluminum coated tape or something. Uh, so the sensor is covered in that on the sides as well. The mounting hardware is covered in that. Also the fan shroud on the bottom, you can see I've, I've covered all of that with aluminum tape as much as I can. Just because I don't want to, I don't want to melt stuff. Um, the fan shroud is Prusa's PC blend, um, as is the x carriage hardware, so that should be fine. And this counter mounting part for the hot end is... Uh, what are you? Uh, fiber, carbon fiber reinforced nylon. So mm, that might not live too long, especially because up here, like the distance is pretty tight. Uh, is isn't this distracting the sensor? I mean, the sensor is still open at the bottom, so it still has its sensing area kind of clear of of most stuff. You can see it's still sticking out. It might slightly change the trigger point, but like as long as it's still consistent, as long as the trigger point is still at a consistent distance, it kind of doesn't really matter. So if it's off, because we, we, we're doing, ugh, we, we're, calcula we're calibrating an offset for this anyway. Wiring for the hot, ooh, hi there, um, where are we at? Wiring for the hot end was a bit tricky. So it looks like these holes on the side, this one, this one goes through to, to in here. So I guess that's one of the positions that you would be able to stick some wiring out. Uh, the sensor wiring, interestingly, goes up and it has a dedicated uh, wire guide. However, the hot end wires, I have routed these out the side so they are still slightly contacting, uh, where are we at? They're still slightly contacting the heater block. And then they come out the side right there and that's that goes up like so. So 
I don't know how correct that is, but it's the, it's on the right side. This is the wire shroud where all the connections are going to be made. Um, hardened wires go up to the side. Okay, so that should be zip tied to the front fan shroud. So to basic, oops, I'm going to tear these out. So basically, Nero, what he's saying, zip tie to this part right here, and kind of route it out like that. A zip tie holes on the shroud. Oh, these. These, okay, I see what you mean. One, two, but I, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to get a zip tie through this. I was wondering what these little nubbins were. They look like print errors. Not sure if I'm going to be able to get a zip tie through this uh, because this was printed pretty sloppily. Um, I, I needed it, and you can see that there's like layer shifting and stuff on this print even. Uh, this is a pretty sloppy print. No, I might, I might try to get some some dip, some zip ties through this. But yeah, that's how that goes on. So basically, up here there there's these two screws where the uh, little ears just latch into. Oh, that's hard to see. Yeah, there's two little ears that just latch into two screws, and then down here that's where that screw to, and that attaches the entirety of the hot end. Um. Yeah, also uh, I put some Molex Microfit connectors onto the two heater cartridges and the one uh, thermistor. So that was a bunch of wiring that I got to cut off uh, because the stock wiring is rather long. So that's how much wiring is included by default. And this is like a, a meter worth of wiring, which may have been just slightly too short. But we do have the wiring loom that goes all the way the, up to the up to the fan shroud. Um, so let's get this one back on. So where are we at? Illegally mounted uh, mosquito magnum plus. Yes. So you're not you're not supposed to mount this uh, mosquito magnum plus with plastic mounts. You're supposed to use all metal hardware. Um, so this, if you choose to replicate it, would be at your own risk, basically. All right, uh, how am I liking the... Yes, so let, let me let me catch up on the chats. Uh, Joseph, and there, thank you for the two bucks the super chat. And thank you to the 50 Swedish Kronos. Uh, how are you liking the Bosch Go? It's fine. It's all right. It's actually, it's okay. I'm, what I'm not liking is that, the, that like the press, the pressure activation is so easy to trigger. Um, so sometimes I would, I would screw stuff and I just bump the screwdriver, well, of course, as I tried to demonstrate it, um, it would it would accidentally trigger. Um, and also the form factor, because it's just a stick. It's just, there's no, there's no T-handle or anything, uh, as you would have with a uh, traditional driver. You really have to grip onto it, or it's going to fly out of your hand. Um, uh, QA RC, this has a torque limiting clutch you see it has an adjustable clutch that you can set to how much torque you want so if you set this to the lowest value this is fine even for well i've torque uh, i've tightened the um m2.5 screws on the mosquito this has a really sensitive torque clutch and i think this tightens screws more consistently than you can by hand so yeah i could use the impact driver i could use my makita impact driver but that that would be seriously stupid. This is, I think, one of the better tools to use for this. I would I would say this is more suited to tightening screws into heat set inserts than doing it by hand would be. So yeah. If you if you don't know if you don't know what the tools do, then like don't make assumptions. Uh what else do we have? Whoops, losing some screws. We also have the fan shroud that now has some Molex microfits on it. Um, and yes, of course, I have also mounted the drag chains because I wanted to see like where everything goes and how the wiring would end up so that I know how short I can cut um, the wires and where I can crimp them. So the uh, x-axis drag chain is installed. Uh, there, x-axis drag chain is installed. Um, that goes to this little nubbin that's part of the afterburner or part part of 
No, it's not part of anything actually. It is uh, literally an extra part that's screwed to the back of the motor. Um, so that's there. I've got my, my connectors there in the correct place. And also we've got the drag chain for the y, uh, yeah, for the Y axis in place. So that moves like that, moves very smoothly. Um, I did need to flip around one of the ends uh, of the drag chain because this was kind of pointing the opposite direction and you know this opening, this flat bit. Actually maybe we can see it on uh, this to this then. So this no this uh end piece right there was the other way around, so kind of pointing up and there's no no opportunity to secure that to anything. So once that gets attached to the dedicated uh, printed part, the other side just gets screwed to the frame. Same with the uh, x-axis drag chain right there. Uh, Nero, the yeah, so the the kit came with openable drag chains. So these have a little latch on the back. You stick a screwdriver and you open them up. So I will need to take these off again, but it's I've, I've saved on screws. Uh, these are not fully tied in yet. Uh, so a couple of screws to take these out and then we can fill them up with wires. Um, yeah, so the this outside is where all the openable uh, latches are. This inside is closed permanently. What else did I do? Uh, anything that I would like to talk about before we get moving here? Um, oh, yes, yes. So we've got a couple new printed parts. Um, these are some mounts that I drew up and made for the Duet uh, 3. So this is for the Duet 3 6HC. This is ABS printed on draft quality. Also has some nice threaded inserts in each of the holes. Those are M4 actually for the Duet 3. As well as the same part in a bit smaller for the Duet 3 3HC expansion board. So these can clip or these can screw to the stock uh, electronics brackets though that mount to the DIN rail. And I intentionally, well for this one it doesn't really matter because it's symmetrical, but for the 6HC uh, we can do it both in this orientation or in that orientation. So we can we can literally mount the do it in any orientation to the bottom of the frame onto the DIN rails. Whew! Wow! So, 20 minutes of updates. Like I said, I spent a couple of hours um, building this. And yeah, this part, I've, I've unfortunately, I, I slightly messed up. Come on. So this is the XY end stop um, bracket. The, the kit comes with a roll of silicone wire. So a whole bunch of wire. Imagine having to wire everything up yourself with this. This is like... 100 meters of, nah, not quite, but quite a lot of, of wire um, just for you to crimp. Um, so I've got the two end stops, I've got the Molex microfit on it, and I, I measure, I think I measured them wrong. Uh, I measured from the wrong pins to each other, uh, thinking, oh, these are just normally open and they don't have the normally closed feature, but I did end up soldering these to the wrong pins. I snipped off the ones that would be normally closed, and just solder to normally open. And yes, the soldering job is kind of ugly, but you're never going to see that unless I show it to you in a close-up on stream live to 700 people. Then you're going to see it, but in practice, you're never going to see it. So these end stops are wired up as normally open, which means they're open circuit and then you press them and they close the circuit. So that is the uh, configuration that is not preferred for this build because then if you have um, a connector fail or a cable break or whatever then you're not going to detect when that end stop is missing so if it's normally closed then if everything is right the um, the mainboard is going to be able to sense that short circuit on the um on the output on the input on the output all right, so basically, basically, uh, let me attach the fan shroud to our extrudinator. 
and then I think we can we can start feeding in some uh, some of the wiring loom. So basically, everything at this point, everything should be um, should be able to just plug into uh, the wiring loom. So all the connectors, all the connect except for well, the, the the heated bed is a different part, but. All the parts, including the sensor, including everything else, um, should just be able to plug in. And there should not be anything else that we have to solder or crimp or modify in some other way. You, you guys seeing how little torque this is? That's how, how sensitive the torque clutch is. I would like you guys, I would like to see you guys do that, that consistently by hand. So that's on. Um, the two fans are working, yeah, so the bottom fan, this is the hot end cooling fan actually down here. Um, this one was giving me some weird noise when I first tried it out and that was, I thought the fan was broken, I, I thought like this was, this was messed up. Um, but it was literally just a piece of my uh, fan trial print sticking up into the fan, so I took that out. Uh, reinstalled it and now we are golden. Whew! All right. All Molex microfits. So that goes up here somehow. Um, do I have some small zip ties? Don't think I have zip ties that small. Do it doesn't include any. And the kit only included some rather large zip ties, so yeah. About time to give a small contribution for all your videos I have watched during last many years. Smiley face. <laughs> Thank you for that, Lars. Uh, glad you're enjoying the videos. Now, one question for for you guys. Um, I got this, this is the other drag chain that was included and actually I broke off one of the latches, but whatever. Um, this is the other drag chain that was included and the way this is configured, so if you use it, if you, if you have it like a loop, like that, this side is fully swiveling and this side is completely locked off. Come on, this side is completely rigid. That is, I, I believe that is the wrong, um, the wrong configuration for this, right? So, if we go back here and we're trying to get this up like this, then either, well, we, we fix one end in place, but then the other end can just dangle around, right? So that's, that's not good. If you do it the other way around, um, do it the other way around and have this kind of fixed up here, then it's going to dangle over into the other direction. So you would, you would need, the fixed one is at the bottom, okay. But then like if you do the fixed one at the bottom, oh, we already zoomed out. If you do the fixed one at the bottom, which is going to end up somewhere around here, then up top here, it's just going to, it's just going to fall over. So, um, yeah, that is actually a part that um, FormBot included incorrectly for uh, for the build. So they, they did include the wrong part. So what that looks like is uh, like that. So that can fully swivel both directions. Take that off. Um, there's the notch that would limit how far these can move. Yeah, there you go. There's the, that, that little notch that would limit it. And there's nothing ripping into that Thank you for all your videos. on the ends. You brought me to my love for Prusa and now you get me to build a Voron. <laughs> well, Christo, thank you for that. Looks like I put you in a good path. First to Prusa, now Voron. <laughs> oh, well. I, I wonder how many people I got into the, the hobby or the, I don't know, for some people it's a job of 3D printing. It's got to be quite a few. So, um, that is that is wrong. So I thought about actually um, melting this in place or, or, or welding this in place with the soldering iron kind of fusing this to the first link because both ends could be fully rigid, right? 
The only problem then is it's going to be a bit hard to wire up because you kind of need to go through here. So I would need to do that once everything is, is wired up and in place. Or, I don't know, just like put a back piece or something across it and, and zip tie it into place. Super glue is probably not going to work because this is nylon, as far as I know. So this is, uh, these should be nylon. Um, and super glue does not stick to a lot of things, including nylon. I'd make sure there's enough chain for the full Z travel before locking anything in. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, or they could have... Ooh, they smell like a burnt motor. They're not ABS. That's for sure. Um, I would say these are nylon. Yeah, so for the... For the X and Y axes, you can see this one is the Y axis direction you're seeing. I have already shortened this one so it's like just at the end, um, just barely not kind of tensioning up as it's at its full travel. That was five links that I got to take out. And on the X axis, it's the same basically. So this one also goes over here. Um, and just kind of barely curls over. Just barely curls over over here. Um, and that was also five. Okay, that's a fairly weak part apparently. That that was also uh, five links too long. So that's that's fine. Um, yeah. Now for the Z axis, or for the Z axis, depending on where you're from. We're gonna need to see how long this is, and this is gonna go inside here. There's a, there's a, where is that part? It's somewhere. I had it. Uh, I think it's this one. No. Well, yes. No. I don't know. There's some part that uh, connects that. So this goes like that, and yeah, if you go all the way up, like this is, this is clearly uh, more than long enough, and possibly too long even. So. Yeah, that's going to be something we're going to have to shorten to an appropriate length at some point. Actually, what we could also do is because of the way these are mounted with... Come on. Uh, with originally three holes, I've already drilled the extra hole in the middle there. Uh, we could just drill a hole through like the openable side and, and mount it like that. So... Mm would not be my preferred um, option there. Anyway, let's get some wiring on the way. So I think we should start, actually, yeah, so wiring loom, wiring loom, oh, wiring loom. This is a, somebody somebody a while ago asked, hey, is this a custom wiring loom uh, from Lineo? And yes, yes it is. Um, so it has all the Duet connectors on the side that is going to the Duet, or most of them already attached. I just have to slide over a couple extra ones. These are the end stops. Then PF, what is PF? Uh, something, HF. It's got all the, the wiring, included and it does have the double heater uh where is that yes yeah, it's, it's actually got dual thermistor um connectors and it's also got dual heaters so yeah that is h0 and they didn't have any h1 so these are both labeled h0 but with a green and a blue so these are the thicker um vh connectors as well for the heaters so this is custom made for this printer which is which is nice of them Definitely saved me a lot of, of work and a lot of crimping. PF part fan? Possibly, yeah. Tip for wiring the drag chains. Undo the end mount, have it straight, open up, put wire through, clip close, and roll it back into position. Yeah, yeah that, that's the that's the plan, Nero. Thanks for that. But that, that is the plan. Um, I just wanted to have all the drag chains on here to make sure that the... Um, 
that I knew like where all the connectors would need to go. Where are we at? Where all the connectors would need to go um, and whether my lengths were okay. But I think that is a good start. So let's get the drag chains off and then we can start feeding in some wires. Because theoretically we should be able to... There's nothing going like through anything. So there's there's no uh, no wiring that's like snaking through this little part. This just goes around here and lays in there. So we should just be able to clamp the drag chains around the wiring loom and then reinstall it all as an assembled part. Uh, part I'm Ronin, the thermo well, the temperature sensor in the hot end is actually just a regular thermistor. Um, well. I'm saying regular, but it is a 500 degrees Celsius type, so it's a it's a bit special, but it's still a thermistor. It doesn't need uh, an amplifier or anything to work. Uh, Monsieur Peanut, you don't need to to double type your stuff. For the Z drag chain, I will I will follow the manual to see where exactly that is going to go. Yo, Mr. Peanut, come on. I'm gonna have to mute you if you keep like triple chatting your stuff. Um, where are we at? So that is the Y drag chain. And that is the X drag chain. And I guess once these are open, we can still twist or, or turn them around the wire, though we probably won't need to do that. So I'm just going to lay this out in the... But at least we, we'd need to do uh, front and back correctly, so we can't feed the wire backwards through it. <laughs> that, would, that would suck. Um, How am I going to do? Uh, how am I going to do this logistically? So on the left, I'm going to have my tool head like this, and then this is in series like so. Right, I think that should work. And then the printer can actually go off the table for now. It's, I mean. It's a heavy boy, but it is it is appropriately heavy, I think, at this point. Okay, so the drag chains basically just open up from the back. Uh, you grab a screwdriver. I had one here yesterday. A screwdriver. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping it's going to magically appear if I keep calling it. But that's not how it works, but I might end up finding it. So the way these work... Stick it in, give it a bit of a twist, and there you go. That opens up. Always let the front part connected with just one screw. Oh, so you were wiring it up in the printer? I'm going to try to wire it up outside the printer. Just make a complete wiring loom that has everything in it. Because we can still like drag stuff through it, right? We can still adjust uh, how much length we get on either, either side of these, right? Thank you for everything you do for the 3D print community. Are the Smat Smite style connectors safe to use on hot end heater connections? Thank you for the 5 DJ Legion. I'm <laughs> glad you're appreciating my work. Uh, the SMAT, SMYT connectors. I will need to Google those in a minute um, because I don't know exactly which ones those are. Uh, also, I think I missed a, uh, a super chat from Aaron Andreas Gekulis. Thank you for that. Let's see there. So that... That, that, ooh, 
Okay. One thing I'm noting, we do need to take out uh, the front element or the, the end cap here. There we go. And then we can just plop this back on over. And then this makes sense because this is the X, Y end stops. Basically, that's all that's going into this, this drag chain. It's nice that this is all tied up and uh, wrapped tightly with, I don't know what this is, but it's like little, it looks like little heat fused uh, wrappy boys. That just lays in there and we can close this back up. Cable ties will get caught up as well. Um, now these can still move fairly freely. Um, they have like a little tiny nubbin on them. But I think they should be able to move freely enough because, I mean, typically the wires in the drag chain don't need to um, like constantly move. They, at, at most they'd move like a millimeter or two one way or another. No, these are not cable ties actually. So they look like cable ties, but they are... They they feel like a like a nylon wrap that gets heat fused at the end or knotted. So these don't have that sharp edge uh, from the from from a cable tie. Um, I guess here you can see it a bit better on this one. So it's just a rather light wrap and it is fairly soft. So it's not going to cut into the wires. Um, Colin, you would probably cut those things anyways. I mean, you that might be an option, but. I like how how clean they end up um, making the entire thing, and, and as you can see, like it it still moves easily enough. Random nerd, no, the cables are not twisted pairs, I believe. Um, let me look up that that SMAT SMYT connector real quick. I might know it, but if I've not seen it yet, um, and I'm probably not gonna have much to say about that. S M Y T S M A T. Okay, no idea what those are. They look like regular two point five millimeter um, pitch connectors, but I I really don't know. Um. Okay, sorry, sorry that I can't answer that. Uh, digital region. There it is. So this is still in the correct orientation. Uh, could you also use electronic tape instead of nylon stuff to bundle the cables? Uh, electronic tape as in like this stuff that is included? So the FormBot kit is including this this fabric tape stuff. Um, this is like what you'd what you'd see on automotive uh, wiring looms, for example, being wrapped with. That could also work, but I would be worried that this would wear through over time because it's it's like a. I mean, I can already feel this. Yeah, getting rougher and, and fuzzier as it's uh, as it's being moved. Not the VHP tape. No, not the VHP tape. Um, so this might not last in a drag chain. It might be okay for having stuff loose and, and wrapped uh, somewhere else, but these are these feel a bit more robust. They might open up at some point, but yeah, would not be my my. Uh, I, I would not choose to put this into a drag chain. Tesla tape, Tesla tape. So what are you trying to say? Tesla is just a, a brand for. Um, adhesive tapes. It's like scotch tape in the US. Actually, I think they're the same, they're the same company. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I'm missing a discussion about uh, twisted wires or twisted pair wiring. Uh, Crystal Miller saying they only make sense for very few specific cases. Now, here's the thing. When you're building a printer yourself, you're rarely concerned about um, electromagnetic compatibility, like what sort of frequencies um, your printer radiates out into the world and what frequencies it picks up from 
outside uh, from the outside world. Uh, manufacturers typically do worry a lot about that when they're making, well, typically the proper manufacturers worry a lot about that when they are um, designing a printer and building one and, you know, selling it to you as a complete product. So, you know, at that point, that, that, that becomes something that you need to have if you're trying to sell a product as part of uh, FCC and CE and, and, you know, all those regulatory um, <sighs> compliance things you have to, uh, to worry about when you're making a product. That is not to say, you know, just because you don't need it for, like, privately built stuff, that is not to say that you shouldn't worry about it. Um, you may still get issues, especially if you have stepper drivers, which are a high frequency chopped signal going over long lengths of cable. You may still cause issues somewhere. You may see issues with uh, radio reception or uh, Wi-Fi working not that well anymore, or what else, uh, baby monitors. That's the sort of equipment that, that is gonna get Let me just remember how what direction this goes on. Uh, that is the sort of like sensitive radio equipment that is going to get issues possibly if, for example, your two meter long antenna uh, starts radiating off energy in that spectrum. So, you know, a twisted pair wire is always the better choice actually. So, uh, for the motors which have the A plus A minus, you would use a twisted pair between those two, and between the B plus B minus, um, just it just reduces the amount of of interference that your printer is giving off by a um, enormous amount by like it's it's a lot that that twisted wire um twisted pair wire helps um for stuff like end stops or well for stuff like end stops in like really fringe cases you might need a twisted pair uh if that is picking up signals um from somewhere else and is false triggering your end stop, but typically you're not, it's not needed. Um, thermistors, don't worry about it, that's a DC signal, like absolutely not needed. Um, heater wires, possibly, because it is a sharply chopped signal as well, though it is a uh, resistive load, so that's not gonna give you any particularly, you know, any particularly strong spikes, but yeah. Um, if you have the option of going for a twisted pair wiring and have the correct uh, pairs twisted together, that's that's just always a that's just always a, a you know a superior choice in in pretty much every way. Of course, twisted pair does take up a bit more volume in your drag chain uh, than just having everything straight like this. So okay. Cut the laces. I'm not gonna cut the laces because this is this is smooth enough. They might they might rub off in in time and they might fall off eventually, but I'm not gonna cut them. So that is on. Now for the Z axis, the Z axis. Um, what do we do with the Z axis? Hmm. So this end, this end right here, that's down to the electronics compartment. Oh, do these. Yeah, these fit. These should fit through the hole in the panel. Um, electronics compartment, that is... Hey... Oh yeah, right, 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 right. This is up to the gantry and then a, I was wondering, like, why is there an A motor connector here when this is already down at the, at the base level? But no, this is still up at the gantry. Um, how do we do the z-axis? I think we should, before we move any further here, I think we should actually get the uh, z-axis drag chain installed. Um, yep. Before, um, before we mount anything else. Uh, Incendium is asking, Nero would put the xy on first. Well, I guess I'm going to disagree with that. Uh, I'm going to put the Z drag chain on first. Any significant benefit in ground shielding your motor wires too, Incendium is asking. Um, 
I would first go with with, with twisted pair. The thing with, with shielding is shielding in a moving cable is uh, is not that great because the shielding is going to see a lot of strain, and it might break over time. Actually, yeah, that is the z-axis. I've already got the the manual open on the correct page. Um, so yeah, it's like electronics, mounting, wiring. We're going to do that after we've got the wires in. Um, I guess just feels better that way. Oh yeah, well, while, while I see it. Um, one thing that was... Ah, this, this print isn't pretty. Um, one thing that was a bit of a mismatch between the um, printed forward printed parts kit uh, and the parts that came in the Voron kit was uh, the power inlet shroud thingy. So this is the one that came with the kit. Oh, it came with the printed forward um, parts kit. And this is the connector or the IEC terminal that came with the FormBot kit. And as you can see, like that, that doesn't fit in. Um, I believe that is for a separate... Um, actually, these are the sort of IEC connector blocks that have uh, some filtering built in. One here and then here a fuse and a switch block, I believe. So that one didn't fit. However, this is the one that is uh, in the CAD model. So I just quickly exported that um, because it is the correct cutout for the switch. So that just goes in here like that, and then well, actually no, that's the that's the correct orientation, not from the back. That goes in here. Um, that's the flush in the end, and then you have two. I believe these are Keystone um, clip-in points where you can attach um, an Ethernet jack, which is also included in the kit. Um, Ethernet jack, um, and then I think there's like a blind plug included for the other side, but you could put any other keystone module into the other side. Uh, do the cheaper plugs can potentially mount, so for safety reasons, PIF only includes the safer plug mount. Safer plug mount? Okay. Okay, so Neri is saying this style of connector block might be a bit crappy. I mean, it does have it does have exposed mains on the back, so yeah, that's something you you will need to worry about. Um, uh, Daniel Lishia, Lishia, um, how to find out which parts need to be printed in red? Um, I mean, none of the parts really need to be printed in red, but you can print any of them in in any accent color. They are labeled in the, when you download the STL pack from, from Warren Design, they are labeled with an A in the file name. That is the accent color set. And also if you look at the printed parts list, um, they're also listed as accent color parts. So that's all, that's all in the documentation. There's some really cheap versions that we've seen melt. What? How would you, how would you get these to melt? These should be rated for 16 amps. Continues. Um, actually, are they? We're 10 amps. Well, I guess, I guess, yeah, if it's not fixed wiring, it's it's 10 amps permanent or continuous. This one's 10 amps. If you 10 amps, uh, 240. I guess if you're doing, um, if you're doing 110 volts in the states or somewhere, then you are going to see higher currents than, um, here in Europe where you have 230 volts. Uh, a heated. Bed, how much was this? Okay, I've rubbed off the labeling, but the heated bed shouldn't be more than the entire printer shouldn't be more than two amps. So I I don't know how this would melt in Europe, US maybe. Can the Warren print nylon by default? Yes. Yes, for sure. Alright. So that is the that's the story of the IEC terminal that's included versus the one that was printed in the printed forward kit. Uh, loose connection heat mill. Yeah, okay. That's that, that's that, that's the z-axis. So we need two parts for this. Actually, one of them is already on here. Yeah, so one of them is already mounted. By the way, I've got this camera up on a higher angle today, and of course, we're still at the, at the wrong height. So one of the mounting blocks is already here, and the other one is going to go down here. Like so. So I just need to find that part. I think it's... No. 
I just had it a second ago. Wow. Um, there are a couple of parts that I'm not using from the printed forward kit, but that is simply because I'm diverging from how this printer like is officially supposed to be built. Um, but typically, yeah, you you would use all of the parts from the from the pit kit. There's that part. Uh, so that that is actually a part that has the mounting pattern fixed. So for the X Y drag chains, you get the options of using a two hole mount or a three hole mount, and the cheap no name drag chains uh, are. Th well, this one's, <laughs> that's the Z-axis one, and it's got four holes, wow! Now, um, so the two outer holes up here and the one down there, that's the stock holes, and I've already added that fourth hole so that this matches up with our mounting pattern on here. You can see that those mostly match up. It's going to be a bit of a, of a clampy uh, fit, but it's going to match up well enough. Um, so yeah. That is that is drilled out to fit those two hole mounts um, because you only get the dual hole mounts with the pit kit, at least for the z-axis. So we also need, I believe, these yeah these little blockeronies. They would go in here and actually hold uh, a pair of uh, hex nuts. Why not? Why not uh, threaded inserts? Are these M4? Oh, they might be M4. Okay, <laughs> don't have threaded inserts for those, or at least they're not. And they would be an extra uh, an extra component for the build. So let's see. Two nondescript screws. Really enjoying this build series. Great design and talented builder make it seem pretty straightforward to assemble. Oh, where is it? Is that did that not spawn a text overlay? Hmm. Thanks for the five, Michael. <laughs> AKA fix him, dude. Great design and talented builder. Talented builder. Uh, builder who has his head everywhere but on the build. But yeah, the, the design is is pretty nice. I gotta say. M5 by 10 button head cap screw. Yeah, for for being a like an, an open source DIY style build, like it's pretty good. So one M5 and the matching uh, T nut. That's the M3s. So for this live build, we're not going to be putting any sort of panels on the machine. Um, the pit kit did not come with panel mounts. Um, that is the acrylic panels on the sides as well as the skirting on the bottom that's going to give you that, that decorative look um, around your Z-axis drives and the fan mounts and all that. Um, that is not included and from what I know, that also takes quite a bit of time to add onto your printer um, basically after the base of the build is uh, after the base of the build is done and then you're spending some more time on um, adding the skirting and stuff so I don't want to do that live just because that that would drag it out way too much okay how do I actually I can just move this up come on There we go. <sighs> That's pretty heavy. <laughs> okay. Hoping that didn't rack it too much. Okay. So that goes in here. Come on. Tilt it in. Then you go on like... So, yeah. And then we need a matching hex key to fix that in place. And this is still going to need to slide around a bit. 
um, just to account for the fact that the yeah oh this this can still adjust even uh, just to account for the fact that yeah the drag chain is going to need to be adjusted to sit in the correct position in the end. Uh, okay, that's there, and then up here ah. Uh, not going to be able to get you guys an angle on that, unfortunately. Because we need to get to this point. Well, maybe, maybe with the... Uh, nope. Maybe like so. Need to get to here. Yeah, look at that. Look at that. Just need to have like four cameras in the studio and then we can we can actually show you guys stuff. So that is the top position for that drag chain. And this needs to go on like I guess. Yeah, the problem is this is gonna be tilting back. Or maybe let's do this then. Um, if I push this far enough down, we actually get the back side of the first link to sit flush against uh, this backer piece. So that at least keeps it from tilting this way, keeps it from, from tilting that way, and then the other direction is controlled by the bottom piece being rigid. So that would be... Or I can, I can just zip tie it. And just leave out the end piece entirely. I think zip tying would actually be. Yeah, zip tying would be the much smarter option here. Just not screw it in place at all and just zip tie closed because it's gonna. Its positioning is gonna be determined by the bottom uh, drag chain being mounted against this piece already. So. Yeah, I'm just I'm just gonna leave I'm just gonna leave out the end piece here, which is the wrong kind. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm liking that. I'm liking that a lot a lot better. Okay, so this side again is the hot inside. So also nothing that we're gonna need to feed through up here. Nope. It's gonna end up there, and then there's gonna be a wire cover here. Yeah. Um yeah, and two to reiterate that answer that uh, Nero gave to Robert, um, yeah, Voron is a community project basically with, you can go bye bye, uh, a community project with no like official kits or anything. So the kit that I am using um, for the uh, for the Voron 2.4, that is a kit that uh, Formbot put together um, commercially them to sell um, and not Voron or the Voron team. So Voron are, are a group of volunteers that are designing this um, and they're not selling parts. Also I, I believe the, the printed forward uh, project is not making anyone any money. Correct me if I'm wrong on that. But yeah, there are no officially endorsed kits as far as I know. So are you in an opening? Oh, I wanted to check the length. Crap. I need to check the length before I feed any, any wiring in. Um, so yeah, any kits are kind of at your own risk, basically. They, they're they not monitored. Well, I guess uh, I guess the Warren team knows that there are kits and they, they, they know kind of what's what's wrong with each, uh, each one, but there are no official kits or anything. Um, that they sell or that are officially endorsed by the project. <coughs> are you not going up any further? Why are you... Oh, because I've got the... Ha! I've got the, the rubber stops in. I still have the rubber stops in my rails. I was wondering, like, why is this not moving any further? So hopefully there's going to be some sort of mechanical stop. Um... Or I'll be pulling off some carriages off of the rails in a second here. Mm. 
We're getting mighty close to the end of, of, the, of the linear rail. Oh, and the tool that is crashing into the um, into the front of the frame. Yeah, I think that's yeah, hot and thanks. I saw that. Um, I think that maybe a bit further. Yeah. So realistically, I'm just gonna line these up to the bottom of the screw hole as best as I can. Uh, realistically, you're not gonna be printing at a Z height higher than this. The printer could still move further, but uh, when it's fully built, there's going to be a panel up top, and you still have your. Oh, this is going to be out of focus now. Uh, you're still going to have your uh, Teflon tube coming out the top here, so this is still going to need some sort of an angle uh, to be able to feed out. So, yeah, done in config. Okay, so you, you really need to trust your <laughs> your safety measures to not shoot these, because this is from what I'm seeing here. Um, the there we are. You can see how much like room there is on that rail right there. There's like a centimeter or something left. But if you look at the drive side of things, it's like another two or three. So you could run, you could run the the carriages off the rails if you wanted to. Uh, the Y direction will crash into the top extrusion. Okay. So there is, I, I, I'm not sure if that is intentional, but um, yeah, I, th there is, I guess, somehow a chance if stuff goes wrong that it could, you know, drag chain, yeah, yeah. That it could perhaps run it off, but realistically, that's not going to be a problem. Back here, back here, that's, that's where the, the y-axis drag chain is going to mount on top of, and there's like five millimeters of space. Drag chain is 10. So oh, oh, you do want to limit uh, Z in the front rate. Yes, you probably do want to do that. So we were going this way. And actually, I think this drag chain is already at pretty much the correct length. Maybe one, one link less. I might, I might as well make it a bit shorter, um, just to give me a bit of extra cable length to work with. Might as well do this, I guess. Eh. 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 Hi. So that's with the bottom position correct. Yeah, because by default the direction is like at that length. But I'm feeling like that. Well, if you move this a bit further over, yeah, yeah, that's that's good. So take out everything up to this one. Yeah. There we go. That is shortened. And uh, I should really like get a camera robot or something that just moves around in front of me instead of having one, two, three, four cameras. Um, just have like one camera quarter dome or something that, that has a single camera with autofocus, just, you know, hotkeys instead of switching between cameras. Um, just have it, have it kind of scoot over here and then scoot up as, as I need it. That would be... That would be pretty cool, but I I would I don't know if, I, if space in here is pretty limited, so that might be a, a tricky fit. Though hardware wise, it shouldn't be that hard. Just um, I guess uh, roll a radius on some on some tubing. DIY camera arm. Yeah, the thing is, if it's just an arm, that wouldn't be enough. It need it would need to be robot, ro robotized, motorized, um, and kind of travel on a curve. Because if it just if it just moves like that, 
you'd, you'd need, well, I guess I would need a, a pan and a tilt axis on top of that either. Yeah. Just get make a robot arm. The thing is, a robot arm needs a lot of space. Space that I don't have in the studio. Um, robot arm kind of has those joints that need to be able to move freely, and that means, like, it, it, it's not just riding on the surface of that quarter dome. Build a hang printer. Well, a hang printer needs even more space than a uh, than a robot arm. So uh, someday, someday I'm gonna have the space for a hang printer. I mean, because realistically, that's room height. I, I can I can touch the, the ceiling without. Oh yeah, without even getting on my toes. So this is it's a small studio, right? So this side needs to come off. Yeah, that should be. It feels like this is just the right length uh, wiring loom wise. Um, I guess I guess if I was to crimp this up myself, I would leave this just ever so slightly longer because this is well. I guess that there's going to be some slack that we're going to be taking out over here and so on. And yeah, this track chain is rather large for the amount of of cabling that we're putting in, but not everyone's going to be um, using a so so neatly bundled up um, wiring loom. So yeah. Are you a camera person? Well, someday. Uh, with the silicon wires, it's pretty stuff busy. Yeah, I would, I would guess so. Uh, thank you for the two, Domenico. Uh, asking any plans for a second custom filament? So, for those of you who don't know, a couple of years ago, actually, um, I did a custom filament with Das Filament, German filament manufacturer, who are doing. Flexibles, PLA, and PTG. I think they make a couple new ones now too. And we've got Infinity Blue, which is a, a sparkly bright blue, kind of like the, the channel color, more or less. Uh, metallic, glittery, sparkly blue. I like it a lot. It's PLA. Um, and two years ago, pre-pandemic, um, we tried to make another one. We tried to get a... Do I have a spool of that? Yeah, actually, this stuff is it. Um, we tried to make a, a second one, um, and I was going to call it Slag Violet. And the idea was to, ha to have... Um, there we go. The idea was to have a transparent PTG purple with black, like, soot flakes, like a, a kind of a, an ash shower, ash rain um, kind of effect to it. The thing is... We didn't get that that like super clear effect because PTG with layer lines and stuff, you're always gonna have some sort of, of milkiness to it. So when it's milky, that effect doesn't work out anymore. And with the flakes that we wanted to use, um, with the size of flaking that we tried to use, it was getting extremely hard to make accurate filament. It was starting to get bumps on the. Yep, hold on. Uh, it was starting to get to get bumps on the surface, and that would get caught by uh, dust filaments quality check equipment uh, because they are constantly monitoring um, how well their filament is, is extruded, and if it's not within tolerance, uh, everything stops. So that was getting triggered. So we eventually, because there were too many issues, we eventually abandoned that idea, unfortunately. And yeah, there is no second. Um, filament color from them. However, I do have um, with Protopasta. Um, while I was there, wow, 2018, I think it was, um, I do have the Tangerine Orange Metallic, aka TOM filament, that is a sparkly orange PLA. So the, the goal was to make a burnt orange, aka those, those lotus um, paints that you can well, if you own Lotus, uh, that he can get burnt orange, 
basically. So that was the goal and we pulled that off fantastically. There is an entire video about the process. And yeah, that is the second custom filament color that is that that bears my name basically. Both both are colors that I really like. I'm trying to find the nuts for this. Um, let me just double check. M3 and M12. Okay, so it's M3 nuts. Yeah, so two sparkly filaments. Two filaments I actually really like in the end. Um, oh, this all has slack. Okay. Uh, two sparkly filaments that I, that I do really end up liking. The third one didn't quite make it because I guess I had I had too high hopes or too high have a goal for what that thing should look like. And turns out you can't you can't actually just make filament with whatever you want. It actually needs to be printable and manufacturable too. Who would have guessed? So you go on here. I'm gonna leave you guys on. Well, actually. Oh, that's gonna work too. This is gonna be tricky with the fully loaded drag chain. But hey, nobody said this would be easy. So is there any sort of... It's just like that and then goes through, through this hole right there. That's going to be a tricky one. You know what? I'm going to attach that before I screw it to the frame. That's going to make it a lot easier, actually. Does flake compromise the strength of plastic? Uh, not, not, not really, I'd say. Though I have not, I have not tested that. But I would, I would guess that it does not make any difference. Might even make it stronger because flake is like it's a it's a consistent what am I trying to say a continuous material that gets added to your filament. Open up a few links. Well, perhaps that's a good idea. Though I can't really move it out of the way because this side is that's the closed side. And then the other side, the other side, well, I can open up the same side that the, uh, nope, <laughs> that the end piece is already covering up. So I'm not going to get any more freedom out of that. So, so that goes like this, that goes like this, so that goes like this. Okay, now, yeah, that's caught. Okay, that's a tricky one. So three pieces that are connecting together, plus the nut that is trying to fall out. And then the same on this side. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that is fun to watch, right? There we go. Got to poke through. And then... Okay, and I can fully tighten it up once it's on the machine and stuff is getting aligned. Just mount the bottom mount further to the right. Um, I do want the bottom mount to uh, to constrain the drag chain a bit. I do want to to keep to have that keep it in place. So if you hook that on here, oh, that is so dark. Oh, the drag chain's opening up. So if we hook that on here, 
then the drag chain might wobble around just a bit too much. But basically, now that allows us to pull everything else up. Yeah. And mount that there. Zip ties. Zip ties. Oh, yeah, they did. They did include a nice bag of uh, zip ties. So. With the drag chains that are included, I just think that is the, you know, using zip ties here is the, is technically the best solution um, for getting everything attached. Ooh, am I going to be able to make it through here? Yeah, 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 no. Is up here is where we're mounting. That's the... Best perspective for now, well, possibly that. So you go through here, you go through here. Yeah, this is one of those things that you're building and you're like, well, I'm going to need to replace this someday. Because this is the best option for now, but it's not a pretty one. It's gonna work until the zip tie lets loose because it's it's getting too warm. Wires need to be managed. <laughs> yeah, so how does that like serial approval process work? Is that like you you basically show that you've built a printer and then you also have to show that you've built it properly. Actually, that's... I'm, I'm liking how rigid that is. So we can do that. We can, well... Probably tighten up the uh, M3 screws in the bottom first. Upload a video on Reddit. Wow, I've, I've never used Reddit. That's going to be a first. I've heard bad things about it. I keep looking for my 2.5mm hex key. There it is. Show a video that shows that it's printing. Can I upload that to YouTube as well? <laughs> YouTube's more my more my style. Okay, so that is square. And then I'm gonna move you. Ah! Does that zip, zip tie qualify as neat? Well, once it's cut off, I think it, it would be. So that is square. Now I can move it over to the position that it needs to be in. And now this should, well, any crookedness is accentuated by the perspective. So, um, yeah, I'm going to, I'm, I'm happy with that. I'm happy with that. Nobody's gonna notice. No, nobody's ever gonna know. That must be so hard to look at with with so much stuff going on. But, um, there is the correct uh, cable for the correct motor for the. What are you a? Uh, yeah. So a motor goes here. And then the B motor goes over yonder, over on the other side. And then that's going to need some zip ties uh, to hide some of the wiring as well, because that is that needs to go over here somehow. Um, I guess you can, yeah, either use like s uh, sticky zip tie bases on the frame if you have black ones, uh, or. I guess you could print something as well that kind of ties it neatly around the bottom of this rail. Oh, 
loving the attention to detail on wiring. Uh, there is no attention to detail so far on this on this wiring job. So can we still push this through? I mean the, the zip tie. Okay, so if I need to to correct the length here, um, I'll need to open up the zip tie again because right now that is kind of locking it in place. Yeah, Florian, that is exactly what I what I was trying to do. Um, but yeah, that that zip tie will need to come off. Let me just get everything else in place, and then we can move on to maybe neating it up a bit. So, you need to come back down. That noise is so, so fascinating. Four stepper motors being pushed. It's like a beehive. So there is, hold on, there is this piece. And this piece goes on here and covers up everything once everything is on, which means that the Cables actually need to poke through this opening right here. So we need to feed everything, including the drag chain, through here. Otherwise, the wiring isn't going to end up neatly in place. So let's go ahead and do that. Uh, black from motor is going to blue on wiring harness. Uh, yeah. Yeah, you're right. I, d I didn't even notice that the wiring harness had... Um, the motor cables on there. I just thought it was in order, but as long as A plus A minus is together, kind of doesn't really matter uh, because you can you can invert the motor direction in so in software. And if like A plus A minus is flipped, that's just going to make the the motor turn backwards. So that is not a huge problem actually. It's an OCD problem, yeah, but. Functionality doesn't matter the slightest bit. Get it wired to the toilet, and then yeah, and then I'm gonna tighten up everything and make sure it's all in the correct spots and at the correct lengths. So how were you going? You were going like hold on. Yeah, okay, like this. With the floppy bit. So this is another one of those unconstrained ends like that. And then this side goes up here. Nero, how many serial numbers do you have? So how often have you done this entire build thing? Do you still do you still have uh do, do you still keep count? You still keep track of that? So, okay. Um, well, Nero looks that up. Um, <laughs> uh, one thing I'm noticing is the wiring is actually touching the belt. So the ZX is built. However, as long as this is kind of out of the way, that shouldn't matter because this side of the belt is static in relation to the um, to the wiring. So this side is actually clamped to the gantry. So this side moves up and down and this side moves at double speed relative to um, to the other side. So it can touch this side, but it can't touch this. Nero is a, a serial killer killing serial numbers. Just a quick check that we can actually get, get this still on. Oh, that, that's looking, mm, that is looking nice and clean. The, the red shroud over the red wiring and just everything fitting in there nicely. You can still see that the, ah, uh, that is nice. So that's four. Got a V1 finished, second switch wire, another V0. Okay. Do you ever have enough? Or does one ever have enough uh, Vorons or? 
Is that just a continuous thing? You have one and then it's like, oh. But I could use, I mean, I, I have the 2.4, but I, I could use a zero, like just for, for smaller stuff. <laughs> Four at the moment. One in waiting, one waiting on bills. Uh, a lost child. The 3D printers have taken him. Other than my PIF kit also has four. Well, I, I guess if you if you're turning out parts for PIF, then you you do need a bit of capacity to print. For this one I should still able should still be able to yeah yeah this can still be adjusted perfectly. All the crimps are in here. That's gonna go under the shroud. Nope. Yes. No. Oh. We're rotating 90 degrees. That's why I'm not finding the right perspective. So now we do the x-axis and it's the same as on the y-axis over here. Yeah, this is actually working out pretty well with uh, getting everything into the drag chains and assembling stuff as a complete unit. So there is the x, y end stops that are going to branch off. This is working very well, I would say. We need a couple more screws out of the big bag of N3 by 8. Yeah, wiring is very satisfying when you can do it properly, like when there's uh, spots to manage uh, stuff, when there is ways to do it cleanly. Um, actually, one of the things I've, I've enjoyed a lot recently is building uh, one of those, um, what are they called, uh, sub-panels, basically, um, for, what is it, the two wall boxes, um, the two EV charges that I have in my garage, um, wired that up, all neat and nice, um, laid out the solid core wire nicely, like, that thing looks beautiful on the inside, and it was a joy to build as well. Because you can do it nicely, you can, you know, you can assemble a sub-panel, you know, DIN rails, all that. You can assemble that nicely, there are proper ways to do it, and when you do that, that's nice. I'm sure electricians who have to do that daily, do you get tired of it at some point, especially when it's like simple stuff. Um, but yeah, if you, if you don't have to do it daily, I think that is something that is very satisfying. If you, I mean, if you know how to do it. So, yeah, and again, if there is a, if there is a way to do it nicely, what, what I, what I hate about builds, about building both like wiring stuff, wiring jobs, um, building 3D printers, building stuff around the house is when I know there's not going to be a nice way to do it. Um, when I know there is going to be some sort of, of spot in the end that I'm going to go, well, this is. This isn't pretty, and I had no chance, no way of, of making it pretty. Here it's like, well, everything is everything has its spots. So for these though, I'm not sure if all of these are gonna have their spots because there are a couple more connectors in here than I think what is intended to fit under this cable cover. Um, this is two extra connectors, for thermistors and in, well, an extra uh, connector for thermistor and an extra connector for heater. That's gonna be a tight one. Yeah, this cover can come off. The connector should be under the shroud on the toolhead. Yeah, that's that's the length that I um, cut everything. Let's see, these are the hot end connectors. That's the length that I cut everything to. Does this actually allow me to... Uh, so that's for that cable. Where are the hot end wires supposed to feed into the front? Like so. I guess that could work. So it would go around the side. Uh, sorry, that's probably... that is hard to see. 
He'll go around the side and then feed in from the front. That's gonna be a tight one, but should be doable in due time. Not today. Not right now. <laughs> um, right. I might need to print a, a bigger, bigger version of these just to give me a bit of extra space. Sure, that's cheating, but I, it's not going to be pretty if I don't, I think. That goes in here, that goes there. Yeah, there's just too much stuff going on. That goes there. So the length here, I think, is good. Length on this guy, I think we're going to be able to reach, well, maybe a bit more. If it's too long, it can at least stick out the back and, and get routed there. That's good. Then you go down here. And actually, that is already at the correct length. So let me get a pair. I'm, I'm actually going to have to grab... X looks too long. Well, you know, here's the thing. When I, when I move this over, this is like the mechanical end position and this is this cannot be any shorter so I don't I don't it, it does ride up on the on the end block a bit but that's how far the tool can go um, right I'm gonna grab some zip ties real quick uh, give me one second I'll be right back. I'll, I'll be I'll be so quick that I don't even need to get the be right back wrap you on. Look at me being all well organized and stuff, knowing exactly where my stuff is. Ha. So, skinny zip ties. I did have like a big bundle of nice skinny ones somewhere else too. Let's use these. Can do pretty tight radius. That's as tight as it gets. Like that is literally locked up. So that there's there's no there's no slack in this. So when it's at the end, this is already tight. Um, and we here, yeah, sure, we can we can pull this up a bit, but over at the end, like there's there's zero slack. Um, 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 um. um. Zip ties. Zip ties in here. So let me see. This side that I'm facing, that is the like pretty side, the visible side. So I do want my zip tie heads to be in the back. And we can do that on this block by fitting it in from the back. And that is going to give us an opportunity to kind of neatly embrace um, the wiring harness from the back. From the back again, this is the side that we're seeing. So from the front, we're only going to see uh, the nice loop. And not the zip tie head. Uh, Paul McGowan, so like, sorry to get off topic, but I just discovered you were using RepRefirm instead of Clipper. Why? Uh, Paul, Clipper doesn't run on Duet 3, and, I, I'm, and I'm using Duet 3 to have room for expandability in the future for future projects. That is all the zip tying I'm going to be able to do here. Um, the top one. So that's the one down here, the top one here. This is already at such a radius that I, I'm not going to be able to get a zip tie in here. There would be another spot that would wrap around like this, but at that position, it's already curling out. 
Uh, will we print today? Definitely not today. Uh, next stream, we're going to do firmware config and all that. Um, so I don't think, I'm not sure if we're, if we're even going to make it next stream. Uh, do it sponsored sponsored the board. Do it did not pay me to use their boards. Um, there, as long as there's money involved, Paul. No, no, they provided the boards for free. As I say in the intro to every single one of these streams, they provided the boards. Um, I was like, well, guys, I need some boards. Uh, would you like to pro? Or they they actually reached out to me. Uh, they were like, hey, Tom, would you like to use do it? And I was like, well, fits perfectly with with what I want to do. So they provided the boards free of charge to me. They did not pay me uh, to use them. Like I said. <sighs> so also move forward to the right in order to change the line of the right and X. The bend will also move towards the right. All right, uh, so that is the XY connector. I can have a look at, at the drag chains um, at some point. So to be honest, I don't, I, I don't think this is like a mechanical issue or anything. This is riding perfectly fine. Yeah, and, and of course you can move this position, the, the position where it's, uh, where it's clamped against the frame. You can move that and kind of a micro adjust here. Actually, I could still move this over by two millimeters and that would kind of not have it ride up as much on the end, but yeah, with um, with the way that this is set up, I think this is this is fine. Uh, how many add-on boards do we have? I have one of the 3HC expansion boards, um, which adds... Oh, one of, one of the links is open. Cool. Uh, one of the three HC expansion boards, with, which adds another three stepper motors and uh, three stepper motors, three heaters, a couple of inputs, a whole bunch of stuff. Move it the other direction? Well, the other direction is fine. Um, as long as this is out of the way. That direction is fine. Uh, still doesn't have the end stop board, so that still needs to get added here. <sighs> oh, tries to overkill. Yeah. Um, Right, so you, what are you? You are you, you are you. So that's the two motors. I think I can put the, I can put these on and there are no zip ties around here anywhere. Nope. So literally just going into the slot. Into the slot right there. You go over and, oh, what type of screw are you? I'm gonna make a wild guess and say you're a 12. Because we didn't mount uh, this wire. Oh yeah, 12 looks good. We didn't mount this wire cover um, when I built the printer. Now, of course, it doesn't have its screws anymore, so... I think 12. 12 makes sense. 12 sticks out about three millimeters into um, the threaded insert, so that's gonna work. One thing that would be interesting uh, to see is how much of a difference uh, servo drive steppers can make. Because that's that's something that is somewhat easily available now. Um, typically, you know, these stepper drivers, they don't have any feedback except for what the trinamic drivers give you. Um, so if they lose a step, they lose a step. That step is gone. Uh, trinamic can try to rehome the printer but it can't it can't really make up for any lost movements directly so the servo a servo would have some sort of active monitoring that tells the driver how much it actually moved versus 
how much it was expecting uh, the motor to move. And that can be very helpful for going at faster speeds, because at, at those faster speeds, you are more likely to lose a step with stepper drivers, um, or stepper motors, with traditional stepper motors. And if you don't need to like limit your feed rates to where your stepper motor can safely go, and you can just crank it as fast as you can, and the, the, the servo drive kind of makes up for for all of that. That could be that could be a nice advantage in, in speeds that you can get. Um, you can get like little integrated modules even that have just the the stepper motor or the, that have a stepper motor where it might be a, uh, a brushless DC motor actually, but it's NEMAT 17 size and you have a, a small board on the back that you just directly feed step and direction into instead of having a separate driver. So it's all one unit. You give it power, you give it step direction enable perhaps, and it it works as a complete unit. Um, I've always wanted to try those. They're not that expensive even. Okay, I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to open this up and just take out a tiny bit of uh, of wire length because that's that's gonna be that's gonna be bothering me for the rest of time just just a bit. So I need to open up this. Or can I maybe maybe can I push some through? Oh yeah, yeah that that works. Ah, nice, beautiful. So just getting some more of this slack out of here. Doesn't need to be much. Closed loop stepper use Allegro drivers, yeah, possibly. Um, does the end need to move over to be over the hole? I guess that's the intent, but then you would have uh, the z-axis direction like very loosely I mean, I, I can show you what that would look like. We can do that. That's not a problem So If you move this over and we actually have the direction going in Like so Now the direction is all crooked and, and unconstrained like that That doesn't look pretty, especially up here. The curve is like very prone to. Nah. Let me see what the what the intended way of building this is. There's the bottom plates missing. Is there a picture of the completed unit? Yes. That looks like it's sitting over the hole, um, but yeah, like that, it's sitting over the hole, and we we're not we don't have that loop. But up here we have a, a direction that is just super not constrained. Uh, cat. Oh, okay. Uh, Nero is saying the CAD and pictures are all for, for a 250 millimeter unit. So, okay. So, because the slot in the uh, in the bottom plate is still centered, but that distance would now be larger, I'm actually going to move it over and build a little loop and, and have this drag chain kind of under tension. I just prefer, I just prefer that the look of that. I just prefer that the drag chain sticking up nicely and being kind of under tension and, and finding its shape instead of being like loosely dangling around. And that loop at the bottom here, I don't mind that. I don't mind that at all. So that is nothing connected but everything wired up. Actually, we can add the uh, we can add the end stop board. That's like the last bit that we can add. And then we can mount some electronics in the bottom. <sighs> End stops, man. So addictive. Now, what type of screw was that? Because that screw does go all the way into 
on here um that's where it mounts it goes all the way into the carriage so that that must be like a 40 or something 40 right here can give that a try that's eh, too long 30 it is then And the wires come out the front like that. Uh, just make sure that Luke doesn't touch the hotbed. Um, yeah, there is. If you look at that, there is. That's. Do I have? Yeah, I have a, a construction square. That's like the level of these two bottom rails that are in the in the printer space. Um, and there's like a, another couple of millimeters there. Uh, and yeah, then the bed kind of builds up on top of that. So there is there is space there. Um, these might get warm from just radiation heat or heat radiation. It's not like we, we've got radioactive stuff here. Um, but just from the heat radiated by uh, the bed. But otherwise these should be fine. Screw heads on the micro switches are a bit big. Yeah, I noticed that. It is kind of tilting, but uh, we're going to give it a quick try in a second and see how well everything fits together. This is, by the way, this is way more torque than what the Bosch Go would apply. This is just by hand, holding the short end. This is way more than the lowest torque setting. But of course we're screwing into uh, the steel body of, uh, of our carriage. So, let me give you a quick try and see if we actually get an end stop click. No? Probably... Probably banging into some wiring somewhere. Get all of that out of the way. Yeah, there it is. So there's that. And there's that, okay. So X, Y, click their end stops, um, wire is all through, drag chains are mostly adjusted, belts are fairly tight, Z-axis belts are, are tight. Somebody noted um, that yeah, Z-axis belts always need a bit more attention than you think. These are, these are on the high side of tension. Uh, Microsoft screws should be flatheads. Yeah, they're they are a weird shape. So I guess now it is time to move on to the electronics and to get some parts mounted. So we're gonna have all the boards. Actually, this printer is not even getting a, a Raspberry Pi. This printer is just getting a uh, Do It 3 and a Do It 3, 3 HC expansion board. Power supply, solid state relay. That should be it. Uh, yeah, Neo, that's that's kind of a, a given for retightening belts after a while. Uh, retightening belts, just making sure nothing has worn it, all your screws are still tight. That. Um, that are on the load and all that. It looks like the other screws in the carriage are touching the contacts of the micro switch. The contacts of the micro switch. I'm gonna. Well, we're gonna we're gonna check the micro switches um, once we do the end stop setup in firmware. But it's it's the screws that are kind of sticking up, so it shouldn't be shouldn't be a problem there. But thank you for the five and thank you for that for for paying attention. Now, one thing that I am still wondering about 
is how do you adjust these? What? Uh, <laughs> what's what's going on? Uh, don't cut the Z-Belts flush too late. Um, the tent that they clamp the tension like what's the uh how do you adjust these how do you adjust the positioning of these as well as the positioning of the rails up top do you just measure that do you just measure how far these are from the from the ends and get it uh, get it adjusted like that i would think so so with that attached, I'm, uh, these are hammerheads, right? God. Meow, 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 meow. That's gonna be painful. Meow, 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 meow. Well, thank you for the five MK. I do have a mute button for these, you know. Is that that would? Oh, it's over. Okay. Do have a mute button for these. Um, yeah, but these right here, these still need some adjustment. Come on, there we go. Because these are not anywhere close to parallel. So, I guess, I guess just measure and adjust, right? Don't need adjustment, but we're gonna mount a bed on these. And if this is like, hold on, uh, if this is like way crooked, then that's not gonna line up. So if we do that, yeah, like this one is three millimeters off. This one doesn't even. <laughs> this this one's not even gonna meet the center of the slot. So, um. Supposedly you're just you're just using three of these, but I'm just I'm just gonna measure. That's that's the that's the way forward that I feel the most comfortable with. So these have it. I could I could measure this from the cat, but yeah, um, thirteen point two in the center. Thirteen point one over here so that should be 13.3 then that is 13.3 which means one millimeter more here 13.1 so this side is 11.9 and 13 so these should be at 12.4 12.4 towards the outer edge. That would give me 13.1, uh, 13.3 in the center and 12.4 at either side. 150 on the center of slot. Okay, 130 on inner edges. Mm, that makes sense. So that means we've got 42 here, then it's 150, 150, 170, so that would be... Uh, that would be difficult math. 42 minus 17 is 25. So 12.5 on either end. So 12.4 was pretty, pretty close. 12.5. And like I said, we're at 11.9 here. On, on a build where everything is meticulously adjusted and kind of you know, we, we try to get everything perfectly, not adjusting something like this, feels wrong. Even though, yeah, it might not be a problem, but it, it does feel wrong. Uh, bed position is just based off the center on the x-axis, okay. So yeah, I think if I do 12.5 on either end, that should be close enough. Like these aren't these aren't like alignment parts for anything. These aren't gonna be um, setting any positions. 
the only thing they do is they clamp down the um, the electronics the electronics rails on the bottom. Unfortunately, those hammerhead nuts on the bottom they are holding on way too well, and I will need to reset these. I will need to reset these, even if I just try and loosen them, they might still flip away. So. Mm. John's asking, are Knipex tools worth the cost or are they more affordable in Germany? Um, so for, for Knipex tools, these are like 15, 16 bucks each, um, which I think is a fair price. I've had these for, probably had these for, for like 15 years now. These are great tools. Uh, this is This is literally my favorite pair of pliers. I love this thing, and I am sure it's gonna last another 50 years after this. So they are they are very nice tools. Not everything they make is perfect. So for example, the wire stripper that they make, garbage, like absolutely garbage. Um, pliers though, so that the the, the automated one-handed wire stripper, forget about that. It's it's blah. I threw mine out a while ago because it was just not working. Um, but like. Basic pliers, fantastic tools. This this sort of wire strip is actually much nicer. Um, also, uh, Knipex Cobra. That is a Wasserpumpenzange, as we call them. Um, absolutely fantastic tools. Love these. They are worth every penny that I pay for them. However, if you are if you're like paying thirty bucks for 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 a regular uh, needle nose plier, I guess these are called. Uh, that that's a tough call. There might be better local brands for you, or more more more. I don't want well better value brands. I, I would guess um, not necessarily cheaper, but just you don't have to spend that much on uh, on quality tools. Locking drop pliers, they, but they don't lock, so they don't have any sort of a locking feature. To them. Why are you so tight? Did they miscut the acrylic panel? Looks like all the, the adjustment range that I've got here. So if I do 12.5 on this end, then I can't do 12.5 on the other end. I uh, might need to open up the, uh, the screws on the bottom a bit more. I refrain. Well, the the uh, where I tend to buy uh, tools, or the the price range that I am I open up. Uh, no, this one. The price range that I tend to buy tools in is not at the super high end, but in like the upper mid range. So like Makita tools. Not that Makita makes a whole range of tools and a whole price range of tools um, from like super entry level stuff to super high end stuff. I'm just gonna move this over as far as I can, that's gonna be it. Um, and then if I don't buy like my, my lifelong keeper tools, which are you know stuff like Knipex, which is reasonably affordable, Makita, which is reasonably affordable, if I don't buy like my lifetime tools. That I'm gonna keep with me until I, I retire and until I you know I'm, until I'm six feet on the ground. Um, I tend to just buy the cheapest tool that's gonna get the job done. There's no no oh let's just get a, a bit more budget no, literally the cheapest tool that I can find because you know either I end up not using it that often and then it's it, it would be a waste to buy anything more expensive, or I really enjoy that sort of tool, and then you know eventually I can I can buy the, the better version of it. But buying tools that are just good enough that you don't have an incentive to replace it, um, but you know still spending basically too much money on them, that's that's just the worst position to be in. I feel like so either get something that's that's really that that just gives you a feel for what the tool is, 
uh, and that he can throw out eventually, or get something you're going to keep for the rest of your life. Um, cheap tools still work. Yes, cheap tools still work for a lot of things, and I, I do have plenty of cheap tools that I maybe don't enjoy using, but that are still doing the job that I bought them for. So. Vera, yeah, also German. Um, Vera also make fantastic tools. I do have, these are, actually these are uh, Vera screwdrivers. Um, and I think I also bought these like 15 years ago. Um, Vera and we, Viha, um, both fantastic brands as well that I do enjoy a lot. One, two, is that a good perspective? That is a perfect perspective. Uh, we need a solid state relay. There, we need a power supply. We do not need a 5 volt power supply because that is included in the do it. Where is that clamp for the power supply for the SSR? It is somewhere. This is our clamp. Well, we're gonna find that when we when we need it. Oh yeah, that is that uh, that keystone uh, module for Ethernet. There it is. Now that's the size of an ITX motherboard. Nah, not quite. Not quite. This is smaller than an ITX. No, it's not that far off. It is not that far off from from an ITX motherboard. That is true. Um, I don't remember the exact dimension of the board, but the mounting holes are 124 by 150 in size, so it's a bit smaller than a, than a micro ITX. Um, what are you? You're labeled CAT6. That's an unshielded keystone uh, through connector. Okay. Believe that that's CAT6? Wow, well, don't really need it. <laughs> so let's start with... Do it. Do it. So we have a wiring length. I think plenty of wiring length so we can reach... That's also the, the length that I cut these... Um, is motor wires too, so it was basically, hey, diagonally, I want to be able to reach any position in the uh, in the bottom compartment here. And yeah, this wiring loom also gives me those same options that I can reach any position in this uh, in this bottom compartment. There is going to be a need for some wire management for some tidying up because well. Uh, in the end, it is still going to be too long of a schlong. So we need the do it uh, do it three six HC, probably probably somewhere in the center, I would say. The three HC. Ooh, and are we going to crash into the power supply? I think that I should mount first. Mm. So this is going to get mounted with the bottom screws here. Power in is going to be back here. So that's going to be where the uh, where the panel is going to sit. So if we do that, then our power in, our um, protective earth, neutral and hot sides are going to be closest to our power in. I kind of don't like that our wiring loom is like right next to the power in. But well, um, now I don't think, yeah, that's, uh, that would actually fit. Okay, so if we have to, we can put the do it right next to the power supply. So that is enough clearance, but because we don't have to, I think I'm actually going to put it here. Uh, 
Oh, Ethernet is gonna get gonna need to get routed somehow. And that again is still going to reach, yeah. I think that would be a good option like this. And then we can have So the SSR goes on like so. Well, we can turn it so that the low voltage side of the SSR is actually facing towards the low voltage to it. I don't want the high voltage side uh, anywhere near to do it. So we can do that. And then we can drop the... Uh, it's on the opposite side, but okay, we can drop the 3HC down here. Cormzilla, no, we will not be printing today. There's still firmware config to be done. There's still testing to be done. Um, yeah, they, we, we're not printing today. I don't even know if we're printing next stream. Now, I don't like that the, um, that the CAN bus connector is like at the very opposite end of, of where we need it to be, but that I think is the one compromise that we're going to have to make. Well. So with why oh you are the wrong bracket. You are not the bracket that I want. You are also the wrong bracket. Printed a couple of these. Uh because we got the dimensions wrong in the first one. So this needs to go this has an orientation. And it is not this because this is 124 by uh, 124 by 130, so this needs to go on like this. We set CAN point up top, which means our mount needs to go on like this. And I did put in the proper countersinks so that I wouldn't be shorting out anything on the bottom of the, uh, of the do it. Alright, so let's grab some of the M2 self-tappers. Remember them being over here. They're actually over there. Um, yeah, so the CAN bus literally just connects the two boards, the, um, the Do It 3 6HC and the 3HC. Uh, and as far as I know, there's like no configuration needed. It's just in the in the setup assistant. You just tell it, hey, yeah, I've got uh, this expansion board connected. And that's it. Uh, ditch the gold SSR. I'll try the gold SSR for now. I don't have anything better than that, because if you buy like a Fotec on, on AliExpress, you get the no-name <laughs> you get a no-name uh, product instead. So I wouldn't really know what else to use instead. Are you Nope, you are one millimeter. But I should really clear off this table. Omron are the spec ones, okay. I mean, so far, um, the format kit has been pretty good about sticking to specs. For the most part. But I guess when they see a chance to save some some money, then they will take it. So theoretically, this should just let me just double check the orientation one more time. Yeah, this should just oh oh I still need to tighten you. Yeah, I would have I would have forgotten. Okay, that should just snap on, and that's an electronics mount. Not super rigid or anything, but I guess it's going to do. Okay, that has grabbed. thing with hammer nuts is always, well, you need to keep pushing in while you tighten it. Or otherwise you're not giving the... Ah, uh, the hammer had a chance to actually flip its head. Yeah. 
and you get you, you just clamp onto um, your front piece and don't actually clamp into the slot. You're just clamping onto the thing you're try, trying to tighten in or you're trying to screw in. And that doesn't make for, for a connection that's worth anything. Okay. Uh, M4 by 10 is what these are mounted with. And then, yeah, we're going to use the uh, Do It Web Control, just the built in Ethernet based interface uh, for controlling a thing. Useless in the past with uh, Do It 2, and that has worked very, very nicely. There is also the option to connect um, the Raspberry Pi that is actually included with the kit. Um, there is the option to connect that Raspberry Pi to the Do It as well. That's what this, uh, this header appears for. But that that mount is very flexy. Um, but that is not really needed, I think. Well, I've not used to do it uh, whether the Raspberry Pi is in the face, but yeah. So do these uh, these thin rail mounts? Do these get secured in any way, or is this just is that all there is? Because that doesn't look very secure to me, to be honest. I mean... <laughs> don't think I have anything, any, any other way of mounting this, uh, except for Perhaps adding another one of those uh, those clampy bits of these uh, that hold everything in place, but it is literally just a, a printed spring that holds everything in place. Maybe they sent you bad to, uh, thin rails. I don't know. These it's hard to make these thin rails improperly. I mean, I guess once it's once the printer is actually upright, shouldn't be much of an issue. Rotate ninety degrees. What is what is ninety degrees gonna do me? <laughs> what is what is that gonna help? Use some gaffer tape to make a tight fit on the din. That's a good suggestion, actually. Uh, thanks for the tip and thanks for the two car. I'm gonna try that. If I do have some, if I have something, then it is a uh, copious amount of gaffer tape. And it is worth a try. So that is roughly around there. So just to build up the rail a bit and to, to add a bit of of beef to it. Oh, now now everything's black. Fantastic. That is a lot better. <laughs> Thank you for that tip card. Yeah. And now that that clamp actually has something to grip into, that is that is just about perfect. Uh, the kit has thin din rails. I mean, theoretically. This shouldn't matter. That the let me let me get a let me get a regular thin device. Uh, one second, and just see what a regular you know electrical device works like.
So here is a uh, just a, a little you know rail mounted uh, single phase power meter. And the way this is mounted, it has uh, one fixed side and one side that you can actually um, lock in place and you can unlock by sticking a screwdriver in there. So this is actually one of the, of the devices that you would typically mount to a DIN rail like this. And it's a bit loose, but it's, it's fine actually. And the thing with these DIN rails is there is, there is a certain amount of you know, flex take up in these devices just by, by the way they are spring mounted. So I don't think that that would be an issue. It's just, well, this board is rather heavy and these printed springs aren't the strongest. So that works. And even in a, in a, in a sub panel, um, you can still move these around by, by hand. Um, they're typically mounted, you know, horizontally and uh, there's a front plate to it that keeps everything in place. So, yeah, um, that, that, rail is, that rail is okay in my book. It's just the combination of the heavy board and the uh, printed mounts, the printed clamps. Okay, next we need one more printed... Yeah, we're going to need the gaff tip again in a second. Uh, one more printed clamp and the mount for the 3HC. Where is my bit? There's my bit. I mean, I guess there is a standard for DIN rails. And these rails, as far as I'm concerned, should be within that standard for DIN rails. What's also cool is that they you know, that these are technically the wrong types because they only have slots for M4 where you would need, for, for this particular build, you would need some with an M5 slot or a 5mm slot, um, but, well, we can make it work. So roughly, actually let me add the board first before we uh, try and mount it somewhere. So again, M4. <laughs> I'll express out of standard, that never happens well. Not much of a surprise. But I mean, so far... So far the kit is pretty good. I mean, really, the rails are the only thing that I, that I remember not being, like, properly at spec. Maybe the drag chains, yes, sure, that they could have included different ones that worked better. But, yeah, so far, it's decent. It is, it is certainly usable. Going like this, like this, or like that. I would say like this, that gives us a bit of extra room for wire management of the stepper cables. Because those are the ones that are limited in length. So you go here. Yep. Which means also, yep, a bit of uh, gaff tape underneath. James Cassidy, thanks for becoming a member. Welcome aboard. Streamlabs is pretty cool with the notifications and stuff. You can You can set up so much. And yeah, members are one of those. Thank you. What is my plan with a huge extruder with huge hot ends? Well, <laughs> print all the things. Hopefully, um, 
print some piff parts if it's good enough. Oh yeah, by the way, um, yeah, and uh, some other plans for making this a high output machine. Uh, this is the clamp that is included with uh, with the kit for the SSR. So this has, I don't know what these hooks are, but this hook up front here and these hook in the backs, these hooks in the back. So between there and there is where you hook in that thin rail. And that's the release. You either press that uh, or you stick a screwdriver in here. So this is heavily spring loaded. So it just really grabs onto that thin rail. Yeah, and this is, that is going nowhere. Like, sure you can push it, but that is really clamping on strongly. So if you have a proper clamping mechanism, your DIN rail spec really does not matter. It doesn't matter if it's like thin, as some of you have said, uh, or thicker. It does it kind of doesn't matter in the end. If you have something that properly clamps onto them. M4. Well, before I go, go digging through this, let me just grab some M4 by 8 screws for the SSR. Uh, we don't have an orientation for this one. We can choose freely. Oh, well. Wow. Just barely not making it in. I guess these can stick out quite a bit. I guess there's not anything that's behind here that would it, that it would crash into. So that's mounted, and then this has the cover that can come off for insulation. No, like you can still reach in onto the uh, onto the high voltage contact, so that's that's not really doing much. Uh, and that was supposed to go on here like that with the... Actually, we can use the... Um, that would be our output for switching the SSR, yeah. Um, so we're using the heated bed output uh, for the SSR, though, I mean, nothing is really a heated bed or a hot end or an in... Well, thermistors are the only thing that are set uh, on the on the do it. Everything is configurable. But because that's where that's gonna go, I think that is a good position for uh, for that SSR. What made you choose a Voron instead of a, a rat rig? Well, people were talking about a Voron, so I thought I should build one of those. And and the decision to build a Voron was I, I made the decision like two months ago or something, at least two months ago. Um, waiting for parts to get here, organizing everything, it's just, you know, that takes a time and back then, like, nobody was talking about uh, rat rigs or, or other builds in that, uh, in that style. Power supply, now the power supply has special brackets for it, that directly attach to the bottom here. Now you could install them like this, you could do that, but then you can't really clip it onto the rail anymore because this side springs in that direction and that side springs in the opposite direction. So you do need to mount these like so, so that you can push it in one side and then the other side is just the, the solid one. Um, yeah, and it, I think it does make sense to install these facing outwards. Now, which length screw are we supposed to use here? Because that is a tricky one. If you use a screw that's too long, you might have a spiky surprise. M4 by 6. Are those even included? Let me let me see if, if that is something that was included in the kit or if I'm gonna have to find something in three by six, nope. M4 by six, okay. Button head.
Smoportis. Um, yeah, I mean, one of the reasons why I built this is well, for, for a lot of people that are watching and maybe playing this these streams uh, while I build. It's just so you don't make the same mistakes that I do, <laughs> or that I make. Um, so far, I feel like, you know, the build has been rather smooth with not a lot of backtracking, but I have had builds where I had to, like, completely disassemble an entire part again because I, I built one part wrong. So, yeah, so far, so good. And I know people will be, be having these streams on while they build another Voron in the future. Um, that is the default comment. Oh, didn't see that. Uh, that is the default comment under these build live streams where it's like, oh yeah, I'm watching this while, while building uh, one of these two. So we're going to need some more gaff tape here. Because this really isn't holding on all too well. Gaff tape. Gaff tape. Yeah, the gaff tape trick. The gaff tape trick is working uh, pretty well. I also have the internet working, uh, helping out. Yeah, I have uh, devs watching me mess up, and that that both puts me on edge. And but it, but it also helps when there's stuff unclear. So that goes there, and then that goes there. So then we go that and over here. Okay, and that is holding on a lot better. Okay. And I believe that's going to be it for today. Um, so I'm, I'm starting to get exhausted. It is nearly 8 p.m. here. So we have the electronics mounted. We still need to do the... One, one moment, please. Now we have the electronics mounted. Um, that's on here. Yeah, that's, that, that fits well enough. Electronics mounted, uh, wires roughly managed, but they're all in the, in the right spaces, in the right spots. Um, what I'm going to do next off camera probably is to make sure that everything is like connected and neatly wired up because it's like futzing wires into place. I don't, I, I, I don't even have a good perspective to show you that sort of stuff. Wiring is going to be just uh, plugging stuff in basically. Um, that and some high volt, well, some some uh, power wiring for the power supply as well as for the uh, two thirty volt stuff. That's on backwards. So that still needs to be done, and then firmware config and testing. And I think that is something we can do in the next stream on June eleventh. Um, just in 3D, no pie needed, nope. The Duet has a web interface built in, so it does have Duet Web Control, which is a basic but pretty fully featured um, web interface. They're saying that you can connect the Pi to this and their Pi interface is supposedly even more capable, but I don't, I don't know what else it would do that the onboard interface does not do. Right then. Um, that's gonna be it for me for today. Thank you all for watching. Uh, thank you all for Again, keeping me company. Thanks to the devs for being here and uh, helping me along with this build. And I will see you all again in two days. Bye. Have a great Thursday evening. <laughs> Bye.